If you would turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 2 and follow along as I read our passage of Scripture tonight or this morning, I'm going to begin in verse 16 and or, uh, rather verse 9 and read down through verse 24. Romans chapter 2. And again, the subject that we've been looking at for a couple of weeks now is focusing on the divine, the holy, and the just wrath of God, his judgment against sinners. And Paul, just jumping in in verse 9, is describing that which the believer looks forward to versus that which the unbeliever who rejects Christ has in store for them. Verse 9, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God, for all have sinned. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, and that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God, and you know his will and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you are yourself a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth, you, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach to one shall not steal. Do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? One should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. Let's pray together before we begin. Our gracious God, we thank you for the privilege we have of coming under the word of our God. For the privilege we have as well as believers, having your spirit within that teaches, that guides, that even convicts, but instructs us with the truth of God. And we praise you that we are not among those that are under your wrath. We are not the suppressors of your truth, but by your good grace and mercy, you drew us to the truth of your son, Jesus Christ, and you blessed us with that heart of faith that is trusted in the Savior, your son, and we are grateful for that. We're grateful for all that it means to us as believers, not only in this life, in releasing us from the bondage of sin, granting forgiveness, but also in the life to come. And all the promises that you've made in your glory and, and the richness of your inheritance that is in store for your people. Bless us as we take this time in worship under your word. We pray that you will minister to those that have need right now at this moment. Minister to the Mesmer and the DeBear family. We commit them to your good grace. We commit Margaret to you as well. How thankful we are that as believers our lives are in your hands and not our own. You are sovereign, you are righteous, you are holy, you are a God of love, and we trust you now in Christ's name. Amen. Well, in our last study, Paul wrote to the church in Rome that all will be judged by God with impartiality and with equity, and we saw that in verses 11 to 12. He then added in verses 13 to 15 that all those who come under God's judgment are not only condemned by God, but they are self-condemned because they made the deliberate choice to put themselves under their own righteousness and to choose their own law for which they would obey. And in giving these lessons on God's judgment to the church, Paul, Paul not only affirms the need that all men have for the gospel, but he instructs the church on practical applications for the Christian and how we are to live, knowing how God examines, how God responds to sin. 
So therefore, even though this passage and all the way into chapter 3, we're going to see this instruction on the judgment of God against unbelievers, even though this applies to unbelievers, there is application for the church here. Because here is where we see God's response, his attitude, and his final condemnation of sin. We see how God judges sin, how God deals with sin. And that should mean something for us this morning. And so again, as I've done before, I'm going to conclude on a few points for us to consider as we move through this text this morning. We're going to pick up in verse 16, where we left off in verse 15 last week, and consider that all sin is exposed before God. Verse 16 is where Paul continues to give the church lessons on the judgment of God. And here he returns to the subject of the day of judgment or the day of wrath, as he's called it before, what we know to be the great white throne where Jesus Christ will judge and condemn all unbelieving Jews and Gentiles. Verse 16 reads, On that day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men, through Christ Jesus. Paul emphasizes a couple of truths here that give to us a further understanding of the principles of judgment that I hope to cover this morning in our study. First, we begin with the day that is being preached here. This day is preached in the gospel. If you're filling in the blanks, please observe here what Paul's saying. That day of judgment is preached in the gospel. Paul saw the preaching of the gospel must include, in other words, the preaching of divine judgment. According to the deep personal commitment that he, Paul, had to preach the gospel, the preaching ministry that Jesus Christ had himself called Paul into, Paul includes this discussion on the wrath of God, the judgment of sinners. Paul was deeply convicted of the importance of doing more than just telling people that they can go to heaven if they put their faith in Jesus, that they can have their sins forgiven. All those are true and should be declared in the gospel. But Paul takes this further, telling them that they will be eternally condemned to hell if they do not put their faith in Christ. This is an essential part of gospel preaching. And this lengthy portion of the letter to the Romans is the preaching of God's judgment whereby the gospel is understood as essential and urgently needed. It's only when we have this understanding of God's judgment against sin do we come to that urgency of our hearts. Those of us that are believers, we understand this. But it is, it is important as a gospel church and as gospel people that we take the word of Christ out to the world around us, there are principles here on God's judgment that need to be communicated to the world. Now, to be sure, just to qualify, when we share Christ with somebody else, we're not going to take them through the entirety of Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3. So I hope we understand in the context what Paul is saying here. He's saying that as we share the gospel, his ministry of gospel preaching has to include the judgment of God against sin. Building on this gospel commission, chapter 1 tells us that Paul was obligated to preach it. And remember, he found no shame in declaring this gospel. In Acts chapter 20, and I'm going to touch on this at the end, in Acts chapter 20, while well, Paul was meeting with the elders from the church of Ephesus, there on the shores of Miletus, he said to them, I did not shrink back or pull back from declaring to you everything you need to know. I presented the whole counsel of God. In other words, the whole counsel of the word of grace was communicated to you. And I can say that the only reason that we would shrink back from sharing that whole counsel, including the judgment of God, is because it is information that is not easy or pleasant to hear. And very likely, when we tell the world these unpleasant things, there is a price to pay for us. Rejection, perhaps shame. None of us want a negative reaction. We don't want rejection. We don't want ridicule, scorn, or shame. Judgment is not what most people want to hear from us, and even many Christians don't want to hear this subject. People want positive affirmation. They want what they think of as grace. They want love. They want comforting words. Yet for Paul, the faithful preaching of the gospel, the message of God's grace, must include the truth about God's wrath and the coming day of eternal judgment. 
And to reinforce my point here, or I would say reinforce Paul's point, Paul refers to the gospel here as his own. Did you notice the words there? This is my gospel. This tells us that Paul has taken full possession of this. He's not saying by this that he has a separate teaching that is independent of the other apostles or early church leaders. Rather, Paul is letting us know that this gospel is one that he personally embraced by faith so as to be saved himself. It is the one he preaches by the calling that was given to him specifically by Jesus Christ. He was commissioned with this gospel. So Paul saw this as his assignment, his calling. It is my gospel. Paul fully internalized and took possession of the gospel. And because he had full possession of that himself, he'd experienced it himself. He was commissioned to preach it. He knew he had to preach it faithfully as Christ had delivered it to him. And remember in Galatians, Paul said that nobody taught me this gospel except Christ himself. He didn't learn it from the apostles. His desert experience had been his seminary training on the doctrines of Christ, which included the wrath of God. In addition, Paul again lets us know who will be seated on that throne of judgment. And we've talked about this before. God will judge, he writes, but through Jesus Christ. And as we've noted before, in John chapter 5, Jesus himself said, not even the Father will judge anyone, but the Father has given to me, Jesus Christ, all judgment. He will be the one seated on the throne. And if you think about it, how appropriate that the one who paid for the sins of his people, that hung on the cross and experienced the wrath of God himself, is the one that will judge those that reject him. It is appropriate that he be seated on that throne of judgment. Second, about that day that is coming, Paul writes in verse 16, that day will expose all hidden things. That day will expose all hidden things. And this is a second lesson that we find here in verse 16. God does not simply judge the visible sins of men or the outward sins. He also judges the secrets of men. And this describes the examination that God makes of all men and women, and it leaves no sin out of his reach or out of his observation. The secret sins of men include not only the thoughts, the motives, and intentions of the heart that the rest of us cannot see, but it also must include the outward deeds that men will act that nobody else sees. The point here is God misses nothing. And I think we are inclined to think that we're only accountable to God for sins that are overtly or actively committed against his laws. If we don't outwardly do them, or if they're not actually deeds that were done, we're not very likely to be all that diligent about confessing them, even as believers. And if we think this way, if we as believers think this way, how much do you suppose more do unbelievers think this way? If I think it in my heart, it's my own personal business. But this is the focus of much of the Sermon on the Mount as a small portion was read to us at the opening of this service. Jesus taught that if you think you're not a murderer because you haven't taken innocent life, but you've thought murderous thoughts or you've been unjustified in your anger, you've already sinned against God. You may not have committed actual adultery, But if you lusted for another in your heart, it is a sin against the laws of Christ. You may think you're righteous to give to the poor or to pray beautifully worded praises and petitions to God. But if you've done these things to be noticed by men to gain their admiration, the secrecy of your foul motive is noted by the Lord. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 4. And this is a well-known text to us, but one that is so important for us to understand in the context of God knowing even the unseen things. And those unseen things will be brought up at the day of judgment. In Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 12 and into verse 13, we read, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two edged sword. And piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joint and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, 
But note, all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The one that we have business to deal with is the judge himself, in other words. And what this lesson in Hebrews teaches us about the judgments of God is that there are no secrets kept from his sight. It doesn't matter to God's justice if we actually practice the sin or we just fought it. It is sin just the same. And in this well-known passage from Hebrews 4, the author is letting us know that God's written word is living. That's a very curious statement for words that are on pages in a book. These are living words. This is the living word of God. And I think it has to be regarded as alive because it is of God. God is the author of life. He is also the author of this book. And it's through these words in his book that God accomplishes his life-giving purposes. He brings about life through this book. Jesus quoted Satan from Deuteronomy chapter 8 when he was tempted in the wilderness. Man shall not live by bread alone, but he shall live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God brings spiritual life from his written word because his power is behind this message. You think about the gospel itself. It brings spiritual life. And this is what the prophet said in Isaiah 54. The word of God does not leave God's mouth without accomplishing everything God intends it to do. Well, I think equally curious is that this living book, this word about life, is also compared to a sword. <laughs> and what is a sword? It's a weapon of war. It's a weapon of death. It's meant to kill. And we can easily picture that which is being cut away and separated as dead tissues of unrighteousness. It's an interesting analogy to give to a living book, but it's descriptive of what God does with his word in the cutting, the separating, and the precision of even dividing soul and spirit. The sword that cuts, divides, and opens up is not exposing sin to God. God already sees the sin. So what is this analogy then in Hebrews chapter 4? The sword is cutting open so that we may see what God already sees. It's exposing our sin and it's exposing the sins of others. How can we possibly as a church do biblical church discipline unless God's word opens up the sin of another person so that we can clearly see and administrate the church business as we're called to? How can you possibly disciple another believer, somebody that's come to you and struggling with a sin, unless the word of God opens up, even exposing the intentions of the heart? You see, the word of God is not opening that up for God to see. It's opening up the intentions of the heart so that you and I can see sin for what it is. And we can see it in ourselves. We can see it in another. Consider the issue of adultery. If we know somebody is committing an adultery, I have no problem saying the motive of your heart is lust. And that person can say to me, you can't judge my heart. And I can say, I'm not. But the word of God does. We let the word of God do the business that we cannot do. It exposes what God already sees. It's a book that God uses to convict, to cut away and remove and to go deep into the spiritual regions of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And we picture this sword in the hand of God who is accomplishing, again, his life-giving purposes. And with this image in mind, everything is bare and exposed to his eyes. He misses nothing. He, he, he overlooks nothing that needs to be accomplished for his redeemed people. And without a doubt, Hebrews chapter 4 is written for the believer. But if you look at verse 13, the unbeliever is also there. No creature, it says, is hidden from his sight. He sees all, he sees everyone, and even the secret things that you and I don't see, he already knows them. And for the unbeliever, every one of those things are going to be the deeds that are written in the book of Christ, that are opened up and expose the sins of others. 
Those who do not have the law but practice his laws by nature, they're going to be judged by his laws when they're violated. Those that do have the law, the Jews themselves, they will be judged by that law. This makes sense when we understand that no creature is hidden from his sight and that everything is exposed before him. As both Romans 2 and Hebrews 4 make clear, at this day of judgment, God will expose every sin, both visible and invisible to men, both the outward sins in secret and the sins within the heart. Nothing will be hidden from his sight. And what verse 16 teaches us about the day of God's wrath is that his son, Jesus Christ, will be the one that is seated on that throne of divine judgment. Every wicked thought and action of men will be exposed and brought against those condemned by him. This doctrine of judgment was very much part of the gospel that Paul was compelled to preach, the gospel that had taken hold of his life and that had dealt with his own sins and had granted him to the righteousness of Christ. That was the gospel he was commissioned to preach. And therefore, it is so right for Paul to say, this is my gospel. Every one of us as believers should be able to say the same thing. This is my gospel. This is the work that Christ has done on my life. And he has spared me from the judgment that I deserved and that I was headed toward and that the perfect justice of God would deal with me over my sins. But praise God, Jesus Christ carried my sins instead. And this brings us to verse 17 down through verse 24 in this examination of the judgment of God. All religious efforts will be judged. At this point in the text, verse 17 lets us know that the spotlight of attention is now clearly directed at Jewish unbelievers. And by unbelievers, we mean those who did not embrace Jesus Christ as their Messiah and Savior. And I say that or make this distinction because the Jews most certainly believed in God. They were believers in the Jewish religion. And they boasted of their attachment to God through his law and through their heritage. And this boasting of God was a confident belief that they were the privileged people of God. Already reserved was their place in heaven and in the kingdom their possession of eternal life. And in their minds, they had no need of a savior. They were looking for a Messiah that would deliver them as a nation, not deliver their souls. Their souls were, souls were already in good keeping with God. That was their boast. Now, in the first half of chapter 2, it was suggested that the Jew was in Paul's mind, but he does not state so. So there are among scholars differing opinions about the first half of Romans chapter 2. Is Paul speaking to Gentiles that were simply self-righteous and more moral than those in chapter 1? Or is he having in mind the Jewish people? I tend to think he has in mind the Jewish people, but we don't really know that for certain until we hit verse 17. Now we know he has some words to say to the Jew. There's no confusion as we enter into this text now that the Jewish religion is under examination. And we say the Jewish religion because what God had given to the Jews in the Old Testament had been modified. It had been misapplied. It had been misused. And now it became man's religion, man's Jewish religion. And the elders, the scribes, the Pharisees, they embodied the Jewish religion and were the spiritual influence that much of Israel followed at this time, an influence that led the Jewish people away from the true worship of God through Christ. This is the Jewish element that Jesus, the early church, the apostles had to deal with. And from this we discern that God's judgment against corrupted religious men is being taught in particular here. And not just simply any religion, but the religion that originally came from God himself. And if that religion is under examination, we know that every other religion on the face of the planet is now coming under the scrutiny of God's wrath. But what Jesus and the early church had to deal with was a Jewish religion that had misapplied God's laws. They'd added their own moral contribution to God's laws. They had assumed that they were righteous enough in keeping the law such that their works were all they needed. 
the religious use of Judaism was their sufficiency. And while they waited for the promised Messiah to come and to rule them as a free nation, they did not need nor seek that Messiah as their Savior. Paul now adds that their religious self-confidence would also come under divine judgment. And he explains why. First, let's look at that religious self-confidence in verses 17 to 20. Very often in the New Testament writings, we see a list of qualities as we find here. Most often it is helpful for us, if not necessary, to look at those individual qualities to gain a better understanding of what we're to learn. But in this case, Paul is merely describing with this list of qualities the Jews in a way that we clearly understand as a highly religious people who are very proud of their identity with the Lord God through the law that was given to them. What Paul was exposing in these verses is the false religious credentials that the Jewish people boasted of, credentials that kept them from being justified by God through faith in his Son. So the term Jew is first something he he exemplifies. He pushes this, the Jew. And it comes from their identity from the tribe of Judah, which they held with great admiration. They rested their spiritual state upon the attachment that they had to the law given through Moses, which along with the Old Testament educated them on the will of God. And while they knew the will of God, it could not be said that they obeyed God's will. Because they were instructed by the law of God, they gave approval to the things that God declared as right and wrong. And they understood those things that were most important to God or the things most excellent in the eyes of God. While they affirmed these things, they most certainly did not live out these things in the way that would worship the Lord. The Jews confidently saw themselves as God's light in a world of darkness. They had the confidence in their superiority, spiritually speaking, to guide those who were blind to the things of God. They were a guide to the more unlearned Jews. They were a guide to the pagan Gentiles. They were the ones who held the wisdom of God. It was their calling to correct the foolishness of fallen man, to be teachers of those who were immature or the simple-minded, teaching the things of God. And these simple-minded ones could have been the spiritually immature Jew or the very uninformed Gentile convert, the Gentile that had turned from paganism to the Jewish ways. They saw themselves as the instructors of these people. And in their standing before the world, the Jew truly boasted in God as those who had the possession of divine knowledge and truth because of the law given to them. This is what we're seeing written down in these verses. The law most certainly was a privilege that God had given to the Jews, giving to them a precious advantage of spiritual knowledge and the truth of God. The law gave them an an advantage. But while those Jews believed they were guide for men in their blindness, they did not discern their own blindness their own lack of knowledge and truth. And while the law should have opened their eyes to understand knowledge and truth, their self-righteousness instead used the law to build a false confidence in their own religious practices. In other words, in their works. As Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3, the law was the tutor that was to bring Israel to Christ so that they may be justified by faith in him and not by their works, Galatians 3, 24. Instead, they made the law to be their religious boasting, keeping them from the truth of God and from the knowledge of salvation in Messiah, in Christ. Paul then moves in verse 21 to 24 to speak of religion that they used, that they believed they had confidence in, was actually dishonoring to God. It brought blasphemy to the name of God. Imagine how these words would have sounded in the ears of Jews during Paul's day. Dishonoring God. Blaspheming the name of God. This is where he exposes their self-confidence as Jews. Paul shows how the very thing that built up that self-confidence was actually dishonoring to God, the God they boasted in. 
And because they had refused to honor God as he deserves, the unbelieving Jews are joined to the same judgment as those found in chapter 1, who refused to honor and praise God with the limited knowledge that they had of God in chapter 1. The Jews had a much fuller knowledge, a grander knowledge, we would say, of God. And even of sin, the sacrifice needed for sin. And therefore, they would face a weightier judgment as well as we saw last week. In verse 21 to 22, just breaking down this religious blasphemy, I want us to consider that old expression of practicing what you preach. In this particular case, the Jews were not practicing what they were preaching. And that's exactly what Paul condemns them for. He describes the kind of religious hypocrisy that embodies false worship. And we're all familiar with that expression, to practice what we preach. They would have thought themselves to be that kind. This is the charge, though, being leveled against them by Paul. You are not practicing what you preach. The examples are then given by teaching one point from God's law that his people are not to steal. The Jew is then questioned, but do you steal? Another command from the law, God's people are not to commit adultery. But again, he questions, but do you commit adultery? And again, it takes us back to the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't it? They looked at the outward. As Jesus said, they cleaned up the cup outwardly pretty well, but inside it was filthy. They didn't look at the heart. So what's implied from these questions is that they were not abiding by the laws that they were teaching as God's commands. And in this case, the truth of God's laws were being taught, but they were only preaching to others when they should have been preaching that same law to themselves, as verse 21 says. What is being described here is religious hypocrisy, a failure to do yourself what you're telling others they should be doing before the Lord. We've already examined the point this point from the Lord's Sermon on the Mount previous, that the heart condition is every bit as important to God as the actions of our hands. The condition of the heart is every bit as important to God as the action of our hands. It is wrong to commit murder. It is also wrong to have murderous anger within our hearts. It's wrong to steal from others. It's also wrong to lust for what others have. And without question, these highly religious people were careful about their rules and their expectations of others, but they were not careful with their hearts. And the last question in verse 22 is puzzling. It accuses the Jew of abhorring idols. But then Paul questions, but do you rob temples? That's a little difficult to interpret. Now, we look back at Old Testament Israel, and there are times when they loved their idols, and they joined in with paganism. But the Jew, again, of Paul's day, and even of Christ's day, they were very diligent to hate idol worship, because they were surrounded in the Roman Empire by a host of idols that were worshipped. So they claimed, we hate idolatry. Now, there's a variety of explanations for what Paul means by the robbing of temples. So we're only speculating a little bit here, but one possible explanation is that the Jews were in some way profiting from temple worship, which would mean financial gain was more important to them than the worship of God. And we do see examples of that throughout the Gospels and the book of Acts. We do know that the Jews would take large sums out of the treasury for themselves. They cannot truly claim that God is being worshipped in that. They have an idol that they've taken on of money, of riches, or even the worship of self. In addition, when the Jews rejected the ways of the Lord, they were robbing God of the worship he deserved. The worship that God's son deserved. The Jews, at least in Paul's day, certainly would have objected to the false gods of the pagan nations around them. But Paul could also have been accusing the Jews of robbing God of worship, which means self-interest, prestige, power, selfishness could all be the idol that they were choosing to worship. And we see that embodied in the religious rulers of Christ's day. What is clear from this passage is that God will judge even religious hypocrisy. 
It is not only important that we possess the truth of God and that we teach the truth of God, we must walk in his truth. We're not only to preach truth to others, we are to preach it to ourselves with the obligation of obedience. And the unbelieving Jews, for all of their piety and their boasting, stood guilty and condemned by the same laws they claimed had made them holy. Donald Barnhouse, in his commentary, wrote, High and holy privileges may become so misused that they become a curse instead of a blessing. High and holy privileges may become so misused that they become a curse instead of a blessing. I hope you see that in looking at the religion of these Jews, there are hints of application here for us as believers. But moving on in our text, one more point to consider, verse 23 and verse 24 is how these, were, these religious, pious men were dishonoring God before others. Their highly religious practices, well, they thought they boasted in God himself, and they thought they were bringing great honor to God, was actually blaspheming the name of God. You who boast in the law, through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. And here Paul is quoting the Old Testament. How the Jews had falsely promoted devotion and obedience to God and his law as a matter of dishonoring God instead. The Jews would have protested this claim by Paul with great hostility, I would suggest, and fervor. And the same will likely be true of any of man's religions that come under the gospel microscope even today. Imagine what it looks like to the false religions when we take the gospel to them and we tell them that your piety, your holiness, your religious moral laws, they are vile in the eyes of God and they don't earn you one bit of his grace. Not one bit. That's an offense in the gospel. What Paul acknowledges in verse 23 was that religion, even the Jewish religion, may boast of honoring God, but if worship is not according to his truth, then they suppress the truth. And this puts the Jewish religionists right back, chapter 1, verse 18. They're among those that were under the wrath of God, being revealed against those who suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness. The misuse of God's law that the unbelieving Jew was guilty of in their religious hypocrisy was not adequately stated as dishonoring God. Paul doesn't stop there. He doesn't just tell them you're dishonoring God. He's got to move to that stronger word. You're actually blaspheming the name of God and you're doing it in front of the world. You're destroying, you're you're mocking the name of God. You're revising God and who he is. You're taking his character and trashing God in the eyes of unsaved people, not knowing that they, the Jews, were unsaved themselves. That would have been a scathing condemnation that deeply would have offended those who saw themselves as so devoted to the Lord God. Yet the way in which they boasted of their religious piety over and against how they walked before the world so sullied the name of God that they were charged with blasphemy. To blaspheme is to rail against It is to defame, to speak evil against, or rail against the very person of God. And this again, the accusation that the Holy Spirit levels against these Jewish unbelievers who claim to be the people of God's own special choice, the Jew. They were taking the things of God, the laws of God, the word of God, the knowledge of God, so badly misapplying, misusing them, that it gave a grossly wrong view of the truth of God, of his righteousness, and the knowledge of who he is and of his salvation. These people gave pretense to a form of God's righteousness that they did not possess themselves. But adding to this, Paul acknowledges their boasting of God was done publicly and to the extent that other unbelievers were seeing and understanding how and what God is not. False religion is a public display of blasphemy that dishonors the truth of God. And the Christian cannot be fooled by this because they look so moral, they can be so ethical, 
and they can do their praying and show their piety in, in their religious expressions. But they fall under this same judgment. If the Jewish religion, the religion given to God's people by God himself, had been so twisted to now be blasphemous, imagine what the other religions of the world that men have actually created and not taken from God, how that come under the judgment of God. This is a serious matter with the Lord. And we can well understand why verse 5 says, they're storing up, they're building up, adding an inventory of God's wrath against themselves for the day of judgment. In their religious practices and piety, they're actually building up that storehouse of judgment. But God clearly is not and will not be tolerant of them in that day of his wrath. We're living in a day and age when man become quite tolerant of all religions, all expressions of faith and worship with exception to the Christian faith. There are very tolerant people, but in the day of judgment, God will not be tolerant. And we can imagine what that will mean for those who continue to reject God's Son to the very end. It is after this tragic picture of religious men and women is stated that Paul again preaches from chapter 3, verse 28, for we maintain a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. The Jews' religious faith was in their own works to keep the law. That's where their faith was anchored, in their own ability to keep the law. Paul's objective in stressing the seriousness of God's judgment, even the judgment of religion on that day, is that man's only hope comes through faith in the gospel of God. This is where we experience the power of God for salvation, as was written in chapter 1. This alone is where sinners experience the righteousness of God, which is imputed to sinners who come by faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the only Savior of men. Now, in closing, I just want to touch on very quickly a couple of principles that we as believers can take from this. I'd originally started off with four statements, but this morning I added a fifth. If you've uh, done an online note sheet, it's not on there. But I did correct it before I printed off this morning, those that are in your bulletin. But I just want to close with these five, perhaps, statements. Number one, how God views hypocrisy. How God views hypocrisy. If we see God's attitude toward the hypocrisy of religion and unsaved people, don't think for one moment that God favors our hypocrisy. Now again, we're not under condemnation, but we're learning the lessons of God's judgment. And we see clearly here how God views hypocrisy. Believers do not stand under the condemnation of God. Our judgment was met on Christ. He took that for us. But we see here the condition of the heart, man's failure to live his truth with integrity, honesty, and consistency. What we preach, what we declare, we need to live. We need to show that consistency. Second, the importance of preaching to self what we preach to others. This is another principle of judgment we see here, a lesson on God's judgment. The importance of preaching to self what we preach to others. It takes us back to the Sermon on the Mount. Before you start dealing with the speck in somebody else's eye, deal with your own law, your own issues. With God's heart against hypocrisy in view, our text shows us the stern judgment of God's heart against a failure to preach biblical truth to ourselves and to live out those truths that we preach to others. And this exposes, number three, the disdain of God against boasting in one's righteousness. Friends, we can live very moral Christian ethical lives, but we do not boast in our own righteousness, do we? It has to be the righteousness of Christ. This is what Paul was bragging on in Philippians chapter 3, not having a righteousness of my own, but a righteousness that comes by God through faith in Jesus Christ. I've been recently listening to a couple of individuals who've had the credible Christian character in speaking of themselves. They're just boasting of how godly they are. 
So that they've taken that boasting of themselves and their own supposed Christian goodness. They're saying, look at me. Look at the things that I do. If we're genuinely walking in truths, our lives will give sufficient witness for Christ without us having to tell everybody how Christ-like we are. Because if you're having to tell everybody how righteous you are, you're probably not. Jesus openly condemned this in a Sermon on the Mount. Great care. Believers with humility and knowing that our righteousness is not our own. It's something that has been granted to us by grace. Our lives and our witness, number four. Our lives and our witness are to honor the name of God. Heaven forbid if believers in how we teach and how we live, if there's such hypocrisy that we're actually dishonoring the name of Christ by teaching his truth, but not living as truth. Given that God will judge even the secret sins, how careful believers should be in honoring him with word, thought, and deed, both the unseen and the seen. We should give no hint of defaming God's name before the world that we preach as gospel light to. We can see God's attitude against religion that does that. As followers of Christ, great care in how we represent God to the world. And this morning, I've added a fifth that I think is important. A fifth statement, making use of the whole counsel of God. Making use of the whole counsel of God. It takes me back to verse 16. This is a principle that applies to all of our Christian ministries, from teaching to preaching to discipleship to counseling, even to our evangelistic efforts. We're making use of of the whole counsel of God. And this is what Paul was saying to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. When it comes to sharing the gospel with the unsaved, we're not talking about preaching the whole 66 books of the Bible here, but rather giving the, believer, the unbeliever the full gospel message, the full gospel account, including the judgment of God against sinners. And I think every one of us that shares the gospel with our neighbors, our family members, we want them to like us and to appreciate us and to admire us. And it would be wonderful if all we had to say is, Jesus loves you, come to him, and all your sins are forgiven, you go to heaven. This may be the part of the gospel that causes the offense when we tell them, if you do not choose Christ, if you do not anchor your faith and trust in Christ, you're already condemned. And you will face Christ as your judge in the end. And I know that saying those things to those that we're witnessing to can lead to rejection and scorn and even broken relationships, broken relationships in your own families. But we know that faith is not something you and I can produce in our preaching. It has to be a work of God. He's the one that has to do faith. Faith's work. And we can be sure that if we present the whole gospel, including the wrath of God, and this view offends that person about God, then God is not presently working faith in them. But if we share the whole counsel of the gospel with the unbeliever, and they are humbled by that, they're broken by that, they're not actually despising God as the judge, but they're kneeling before him, there's a good chance that the true work of faith being done by the Spirit of God is being accomplished, and guess what? He's using you to do it. I'm encouraging all of us in this to be bold with our gospel witness, to use the whole counsel of God's word in sharing Christ with a broken world. Father, as we close this hour and we prepare ourselves even for worshiping together with the bread and the cup, we want to give thanks, we want to worship you now, for being a God of grace, of mercy, and love for sinners. We're reading about the intensity of your judgment against sin, and it describes the holiness of your character that abhors wickedness and unrighteousness, and you will hold all men accountable for it. But at the same time, the gospel is the thing that we see here. It's justification by faith apart from works that rescues us from this judgment. And that's the glory of this message. We don't have to be lost and left to the judgment of God. We can enter in under Christ where he took the judgment of sinners upon himself. 
So we have a glorious message, Father. We ask that you give us a boldness to preach it, to live it, to not be hypocrites in it, in any way to defame or dishonor your name, but to live as light in this world, to preach to ourselves as to preach to others, and that we rest upon the whole counsel of God. Give us strength as a church.